Hi, I'm back with another 10 Amiga games that flew under the radar for most back in the day. So, let's see if it was for good, or did we miss something fun? Clownomania is a top-down isometric arcade action game with some puzzling elements. The idea here is that simple. You play as a clown, so a horror for any and all kids out there, and you need to collect all balls and diamonds scattered around dozens of stages. Balls are worth 1 point, while diamonds are a nice round 10. So, naturally, the game is played for points. Well, and for fun, but for points too. The stages are presented in an isometric view and composed out of platforms suspended at different heights. They are accessible by ladders, teleports or jumps. Some of the jumps in some of the levels, however, need to be picked up first for you to be able to activate them. And since they tend to move around the level, it's crucial to plan ahead not to get irreversibly stuck somewhere. You could say that Clownomania is a 3D Pac-Man clone, but while there are some obvious similarities, the differences are plenty and the general feeling of the game is a bit different. There's quite a lot of more thinking involved in Clownomania and less arcade action. First of all, Clownomania keeps introducing new concepts and mechanics as you progress through it, at a very steady and fair pace, I must add. In fact, it's one of the smoothest and most user-friendly progressions I've seen. Initially, your levels are all about collecting those pickups for points and nothing more. Then the game introduces some of the special floor squares that change colors as you walk over them, and having completed a level with all of their colors changed, rewards a massive 10,000 points bonus. Then the enemies appear. But they walk on pre-assigned paths only and henceforth are not an issue whatsoever. If you make sure to avoid them, that is. In time, however, as you conquer more and more stages, they will start to actively hunt you down as soon as they see you. Same goes for different gameplay mechanics, all the funnels, enemy killing and stopping pyramids, speed up one way movement or death tiles among others are introduced gradually, giving you plenty time to get used to their use case scenarios so that you've never feeling as if you were thrown into deep water. Now, I get that from presentation point of view and the idea behind the whole game, Clownomania may seem like a remnant from an 8-bit era, but trust me, if you give it time and attention, you'll have a lot of fun. Action Service aka Combat Course is an action arcade military bootcamp simulator. Well, I say simulator, but in reality, if you really take a look at what the game is, and not what it claims to be, it's like one of those multidiscipline sports games, just military themed and having just one, but customizable discipline only. It doesn't mean that it's bad or that gets old quickly, it's actually a pretty fun little title. There are five levels to complete in the game and a course construction set which allows for creation of your own obstacle courses to challenge your friends at four points. First level is a physical challenge stage and it requires you to jump over walls, scale trenches, crawl under barbed wires and the likes. Second level is a so-called risk course, as in taking risks and not playing the everyone's favorite board game, though that would be a decent surprise for most. Not me, as I hate risk with a passion of a customer-less hairdresser. All you do in this one is plant dynamite in appropriate spots and throw grenades. Well, not all, but most. Third level is hand-to-hand -hand combat stage where you have to defeat a generic opponent. Fourth level combines the previous three in one continuous challenge and last fifth does the same as fourth but in a random manner which means that you'll be facing different obstacles randomly scattered around the stage, elements to explode, guard dogs to hide from on the trees and enemies, both to beat in hand-to-hand -hand combat or with guns to take out silently or shoot. Points are awarded for correct navigation of obstacles or dangers that you'll face and deducted for fails or missteps. Action Service may not be a title to play for hours on end, it doesn't have a captivating story that will engage you in following the plot full of twists and turns, but if you have a buddy with you, or a few, it's quite fun to make your own courses and then challenge each other for points on them. It's crazy how a game as good as Crazy Seasons could be so little known. And yet, here we are in an obscure games video, with it stuck between titles many of which deserved to be forgotten. Oh well, it is what it is. And Crazy Season is a single screen action arcade platformer with some simple environmental puzzling elements. Now, the game has a story, but it's rather bizarre one, so better find somewhere to sit as your mind's about to be blown by the absurdity. Two penguin scientists, yes, I said just that, you did not misheard, penguin scientists, are working on a time machine. Uh huh. That's not a mistake either, time machine. And get that, on their space station. I'm sure that by now you're not surprised and yeah, also true, they do in fact have a space station. And for whatever the reason, they decided to power it all with an Amiga. 
and that Amiga crashed to a now famous Guru meditation screen, causing the whole system to become unstable. Potential consequences of this terrible occurrence include, but are not limited to, creation of a temporal anomaly that will mix up Earth seasons and creation of a rogue AI that will take over my YouTube channel and keep dropping videos for you on a regular basis. Oh wait, never mind. So, it's up to the two penguin buddies to rearrange the blocks powering the time machine in each of the levels to avert the catastrophe. Naturally, as in most games, Crazy Seasons is best played with a friend in simultaneous multiplayer, but if you've no one to do so with, it's a decent fun alone too. The gameplay revolves around defeating various cute enemies that drop food and pickups when killed and rearranging four blocks in a unique pattern that's shown at the bottom of the screen for each stage. These blocks are also used to kill the enemies, so keep that in mind. The game is divided into four worlds named after seasons, each consisting of numerous singular stages. Every few of these you get a boss fight too, and these are usually more imaginative and fun, and a nice refresher between the regular gameplay loop. If you've not played Crazy Seasons, grab a friend and deep dive into this maddeningly fun little game. Combo Racer is a Lotus Turbo Challenge, but not in a brand new and still shiny Lotus, but on a motorbike with a sidecar dangling next to it and a passenger occupying its seat. Weird way to race perhaps, but apparently it was not something unusual in the late 80s and early 90s. I've never seen it live or on TV, so I have to trust that that's what really was taking place. Either way, whether it was or was not happening, it does actually take place in our today's video game, and to my surprise, it's actually rather fun, especially in a two-player mode, but we'll get to that in a minute. Single player plays identically to Lotus with manual gearbox but is set on circuits rather than straight stretch of the road and you can choose how many laps you'd like to race for, ranging from 5 to 25. It's a decently fun racing experience but nothing exceptional. The most fun combo racer is when played in multiplayer, in which one of you controls turning, acceleration, braking and gears and the other, sitting in a sidecar, is responsible for correct positioning on all corners, as in moving around the whole bike and the sidecar to provide the counterbalance. His movement and skill easily decides who wins and who loses the race. I mean, if he positions himself incorrectly, not only you may be sliding on the corners and or losing speed, but also you may actually get thrown off the track, flying through air to your demise, leaving but a bloody pulp behind and a long trail of fresh innards. Wow, that got out of the hand quickly. Naturally, nothing like that happens and when you crash, all you really lose is a lot of time getting back on the proverbial horse to carry on racing. So, while the first player definitely has the most to do, the speed at which you'll complete the laps overall is basically in the hands, or a lean body actually, of the other. Initially, I'd suggest leaning towards the apex of the bend when playing as a passenger and with enough practice you'll figure out how much you should lean to. So, Combo Racer, fun game in single player, more fun in multi, but most fun when you actually begin creating the courses for racing yourself, as the built-in track editor is incredibly user-friendly, easy to grasp and fast to use. If you like racing games and have someone to play with, Combo Racer may be the best game for an afternoon of daredevil cornering you had in a while. Cool World failed to gain any traction and remained largely ignored and unknown, and good, because it wasn't cool at all. It was based on an animated movie of the same title, and believe it or not, the movie too was rather bad. So for one, it's not a tie-in that failed to deliver, but rather held the same quality the source material offered. Simply put, Cool World is a 2D action platformer in which you portray Frank Harris, a protagonist of the movie and a detective hired to stop boobalicious cartoon hottie Hollywood, awesome name I must add, from leaving the cartoon realm and entering the real world. Interesting, right? Well, you won't get to experience it in the game at all. You're armed with a fountain pen, one of the worst projectile weapons known to men, decent in melee, but unfortunately, there's no melee in Cool World. And you run around the streets of your city, shooting at so-called doodles, so cartoon characters that escaped the imaginary comic book Cool World, and entered ours. Other than the annihilation of these doodles, you collect coins. Coins that you can later on use to bribe the cartoon doors to let you pass them to get to the Cool World. So if they're invading us, you're going to give them the taste of their own medicine and invade them. Why not, right? You have an overlay map accessible at all times on which you can check which of the doors is ready to accept your bribe and pass you through. In the cool world you do more or less the same, but other than the zapping you also have to suck those doodles back up through the nip of the pen. In cool world. Oh my god, I should have announced the drinking game out of this game preview so that anytime you hear me say cool world, you drink. It's a bit late now, isn't it? Your aim is to stop the doodles from passing to our world through vortexes and big holes, which act as portals to reality. 
If you skip any, you can always jump behind them through the vortex to get them before they get to the household objects that they for whatever the reason want to steal. If you manage to sustain the balance long enough, so in layman's turn survive and keep doing what you've been doing all along, the level is completed and you get transported back to the street to repeat the whole boring dance once more, just in a different location. Don't get me wrong here, Cool World is not unplayable, it's not broken and it's not trash. It's just not very good. It feels like you're constantly maintaining the spillage of doodles level after level and never feeling as if you progressed or made an impact, as what you do never changes. It's just not satisfying and extremely repeatable. Weird but genius, stupidly named Professor KK Renegade predicted a huge asteroid hitting Earth and a catastrophe that will follow. I don't know about you, but I prefer my scientists to do the math to figure out things like that rather than predict them. Soon after he did that though, he went AWOL. Whether he's hiding, seeking shelter or trying to figure out a solution for the approaching Earth-shattering fireball, we do not know, as he is nowhere to be found. So, my dear adventurous viewer, naturally, you're the one to find him. Why would you look for him if the world's coming to an end and Bruce Willis is in no shape or form to save us? Well, because I asked you nicely. And also, because you're the hero and they always stand up to face the danger. Terramax is an action-adventure platformer in which you're playing as one of the few adventurers that you can pick at the game start, trying to desperately locate the missing professor within the 30 days time limit. All of these personas come from different countries and picking one over another has a reason, as each of them can use various different and specific only to them found objects. The game can be beaten with any, so no wrong choices here, but the way you approach it is based on whom you pick. Teramex starts with you on a trail to find Professor Renegade. To get to him, you will need to pass many dangers, some of them can be platformed around, while others may require solving, using many of the in-game found objects. And that's the part of the fun of Teramex that it requires you not only to survive the tests of courage, but also figure out which items and where should be used to overcome different obstacles. Sure, some of the puzzles may be a bit trial and error -y, but most have some kind of a logical solution. It's worth pointing out that not all objects found serve a purpose, and few may be there just to clutter your inventory. Or not inventory per se, but bother one of your item bearers. Because you alone can only carry one object at the time, and the rest is held by your following bearers. An odd stereotype, but given when and where the game is set in, you could sorta of agree that it's a correct assumption that the traveler would hire a few helpers for his adventure. Anyway, when you finally find the missing scientist, it will turn out that he'd figure out the solution to the problem already and just needs a little help. It seems that the catastrophe can be averted with use of the so-called anti-asteroid deflector. Who knew? If I did, I'd bring it with me. I have at least like five of these in my attic. And all that he needs to put it together, and I'm dead serious here, are the 9V battery, atomic pile, whatever that is, and a bent cold hanger. Naturally, you'll be tasked with delivering all of them to the professor. I know that most of what I said about it make it seem weird, but Terramex is a rather fun game and one definitely worth experiencing. When I look at Cosmic Spacehead, two things come to my mind. First, that it looks like those old Hanna-Barbera cartoons, you know, Flintstones, Jetsons, Yogi Bear, the likes. And second, is the time when I first saw it in a gaming mug. It looked like something straight from a cartoon, so I needed to get it. I craved it, I wanted it, and I was sure it would be great. And believe it or not, as many games as I managed to get my pose on, I never secured Cosmic Space Hat on the Amiga, which is odd given how easily accessible pirated copies of the games were back then. You could basically get one within a week or so from its official release. It was a real wild west of gaming back then. With all the obligatory yeehas and howdy partners. Despite that, I never saw it until years later. That's how obscure it was, at least where I live, that is. Anyway, Cosmic Spacehead is a side view action arcade adventure, and it's an unusual one at that. As while well, technically being more of an adventure than anything else, it mixes both genres quite well. You spend most of your time in the adventuring part of the game, where same as in most other point and clickers, you explore the available locations, find and use various objects, and talk to characters that you'll meet. So do the typical pointing and clicking till you exhaust all the available options and have to progress further. So, when you have to go to a new location, one you've not been to before, you are actually required to traverse there in an arcade mini-game. Which is perhaps not strong enough quality wise addition to be a separate game, but as an in-between adventure sections palette cleaner, it works perfectly. When a particular arcade section has been completed between the two locations, it won't require redoing on future traversals. 
but worry not, if you like this, they're quite varied, ranging from astro car racing through robot attacks to asteroid fields and anything in between, and there's 32 of them, so should last you a while. Story-wise, you'll Linus, not the one of Tech Tips fame, but an alien boy, who crash landed on an unknown to him planet Earth, and after coming back home, he's greeted with disbelief, doubts and ridicule, when it comes to his extraterrestrial discovery. So, he aims to get back to Earth to take pictures that would prove that it actually exists. Simple story perhaps, but I feel that the game was always targeted towards a bit younger audience, so it fits rather well. If you get a chance, definitely check it out, it's rather cute and fun. In the far off future, in universe far, far, far away, a spacefaring race of Telerons live. They're very technologically advanced, they're like the Space Tesla, working on various Space Tesla techs and using them to better their Space Tesla lives. Now, you're probably thinking now that they all must be great then, having access to what other species don't. Well, not really, because while they can build their sonic showers, matter replicators and the likes, yeah, I'm guessing it's not in the game's lore, their home planet is completely drained of its resources. It's like raisin that laid in the corner on a floor for a couple of hot summer months. More of a stone than a grape at that point. So, they moved on to living in numerous space colonies. Colonies that require a lot of energy, and they like Teslas do. And it's that energy that's the game's all about. Cosmostraction is a turn-based non-combat space strategy puzzle mixture for up to two players, in which your goal is to provide the space colonies with energy and get more points than your opponent does. You do so by constructing energy ducts between the colony and planetoids. You earn points by placing two beings on stable asteroids, by communicating with Teleron space stations and by beating your opponent in completing the connection first. The gameplay mechanics themselves are a bit like those found in Pipe Mania, but played in turns with each of the two competing sides placing at least one and no more than five pieces of tubing each turn. Cosmostraction is a difficult game to explain in such a short time, but very easy to grasp when actually playing. It's an interesting take on an 8-bit classic, rehashed and well suited for those who prefer turn-based games rather than frantic arcade ones, and a lot of fun if you give it a minute to learn its tropes. Crash Garrett is a text parser adventure, so I've never played it and never will. But I've read few reviews of it and saw some videos too, so I feel confident in being able to at least tell you a little about it. You play as a titular hero, or more accurately as his inner voice, and I use the word hero here quite liberally, as what you really are is glorified taxi driver. Well, taxi flyer, since you're delivering your passengers to their destinations by means of expert piloting. You cater to the rich, cause you know, poor either use regular taxis, public transport or walk, and the game starts with you taking renowned journalist Miss Cynthia Slees to an interview with famous psychoanalyst to the stars on a brain that keeps brains of the most famous from going cuckoo. As it turns out, not only the shrinks not at all what he's known for, but his hospital is also a front for a very, well, let's say Aryan-loving group of people. Soon enough, both Crush and Cynthia find themselves in a really sour pickle, and will have to power through eating it to save the day, with all the potential gastrointestinal consequences in mind. The game's played mostly in series of static screens, serving as setups for each scene, with all the action on them displayed in text, pop-up windows and speech bubbles. The presentation's rather nice for 1989, though that's hardly an achievement in completely static title. From what I've learned, the parser is not great, and figuring out what, when and how to write in it may require a bit of trial and error. If you like those types of games, it's definitely one worth checking out, especially that it has no presence at all on the Lemon Amiga website. So it's like a literal definition of obscure, but if you're like me, it's one to skip. Crime City is a first-person perspective detective point-and-click adventure game. Your father, a notable and well-known PI, has been arrested for a murder of his best friend. Naturally, a murder he did not commit. And it's up to you, a wannabe detective novels writer, to gather the evidence necessary to prove the claims wrong and your father's innocence. Because guilty until proven innocent does not exist in the game's lore. Anyway, the game starts in your father's office, which will effectively become your base of operations. Initially, the game only gives you a few areas to visit, but as you find clues and follow on the leads, the city will open up for you. High-class areas as much as its underbelly. Interestingly enough, Crime City uses two very interesting mechanics that most adventure games don't, namely time and money. First, keeps passing by and influences a lot of things, like availability of certain people that you can talk to, your character getting tired the longer he's on his legs, and time it takes to get from point A to point B. Walking takes more of it, while taxi is much faster, but costs money. Money that you will also have to spend to get information or to train. I don't want to spoil it too much, so just keep that in mind. 
you can get the money by stock trading from your father's office, excuse me, your HQ, and it's crucial for you to work it out fast as you'll need it all the time. Money, not the HQ. Fortunately, it's not very difficult to figure out, so you'll be a walking bank in no time. Also, because you're my viewer, so you're really, really smart, like a 1% of a 1% of most intelligent people out there, that's why there's so few of you. So, while having to monitor your energy, time and money and working on the case can be really fun in Crime City, it has to be said that sometimes you'll find yourself yo-yoing between few characters, asking them follow-up questions, just because a conversation with one might have unlocked more information to inquire about from another. It's not a big issue, but can get tedious at times. Crime City is decent fun, and if you like adventure games, especially unusual ones, it's definitely a title not to skip. I feel that most of today's games were rather decent, with few hidden gems and just a couple of thirds. What do you think of the games though? Let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.